It is Locked on Jazz for the, what is that, 3rd of October. Day one of the preseason is in the books. What did we learn from Will Hardy about what's important? Who stood out as exceptional and who struggled? It's all coming up on today's edition of Locked on Jazz. You are Locked on Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. How are you? I'm David Locke, radio voice of the Utah Jazz, Jazz NBA insider. This is Locked On Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz, giving you insight, expertise, geeky numbers, and hopefully making it way better to be a Jazz fan each and every day. Thank you so much for making Locked On Jazz your first listen of the day. We are free and available on all podcast platforms, including this one you're listening to right now, or on YouTube. YouTube question of the day, what ha- impressed you the most yesterday about the Utah Jazz in preseason game? Number one, give me your comments on YouTube. Thumbs up or always appreciate five stars. And if you're listening on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button and the notification as well. Today's show is brought to you by LinkedIn. And LinkedIn, uh, the answer for all of your job needs out there with LinkedIn. Uh, So thank you very much for LinkedIn for the sponsorship. Uh, Helps you find qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash LockedOnNBA. So we got preseason game number one. And there were a bunch of things to it but a quick summary of the game in case you missed it I know infinity was having some technical difficulties you also got a Sunday conference going on in the state you got other things going on so just here's here's a quick summary uh and and we'll get into the various aspects the the first kind of chronological news item of the night was the jazz starting lineup was Mike Conley with Malik Beasley Lowry Markinen Kelly Olenek and Jared Vanderbilt so Colin Sexton came off the bench and the jazz played big um, and that was kind of the first item. We'll dig into that a little bit in a second. They came out. They were feisty. They played hard. They were aggressive. They forced nine turnovers by the Raptors in the first quarter. They were really into guys uh, and, and were kind of putting pressure and, and having an impact on the game offensively. It was a little rough, but you could see it. They got out. They were playing with some pace. Uh, Markinen was was particularly good in the uh, uh, open court. And, and that persisted through the first half. So in, in the second, first quarter, they were down one, or they were tied, and then at halftime, they were down uh, by, uh, then they were down by, let's see, they were tied at the end of one, down by one at halftime. So they, they really did kind of, they executed what, you, what you'd want to see from Will Hardy. They were playing hard, with a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of fights. And then... The third quarter came, and they, they couldn't score was the first thing. They didn't have a field goal or a point till the 745 mark of uh, – I have no idea what's making that sound. If you guys are hearing that, I am so sorry. I am clearly hearing it in my headphones. Um, so I apologize, and hopefully it's going to stop. Uh, it's always super hard to, like, now that we've added video, the fact that I'm bouncing between different cities, different hotels, uh, trying to use tag board – Doing all these things, always super complicated um, on that kind of setup on the road. So I apologize. Hopefully today uh, we'll be all right. Uh, anyway, uh, so the – and I'm old. Uh, those I can tell you what that is. That's a bunch of messages coming in for me. But um, all right. So anyway, uh, then they – the third quarter they just – I mean, they just got blitzed. They did not score a field goal to the 745 mark. They couldn't put the ball in the basket. Uh, they suddenly shot it, you know, brutally, and the Raptors got going. Well, what's interesting about this is that was not the Raptors' starters. The Raptors had put their their main guys on the bench. So, you know, what happened at that point? Did the Jazz relax? Did the guys on the Raptors trying to make the team bring a higher level of intensity? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, but playing, you know, playing the way the Jazz want to play this year, this kind of feisty, into you, aggressive, hard, high pace is going to take a lot of energy and a lot of juice. And they may have learned if they let off. I mean, late in the game, certainly the defense, there was a lot of airspace uh, for some of those shots. So that's kind of the quick summary of the night. A lot of energy, a lot of feistiness um, early, 
lot of ball movement, playing five out, driving lanes, a lot of handoffs, a lot of activity, uh, and then it just kind of began to peter out as the, as the night went on. Um, the rotation in the starting lineup, I think, was the first big story, so that's Mike Conley gets the start uh, with Malik Beasley, Lowry Markin, and Kelly Olenek and Jared Vanderbilt. I think you have to think about it as though, in watching the rotations, as though Vando is the center. Um, and what I mean by that and, and and if you're wondering, you know, wh well, what do you mean? Why? Because if you watch the rotation, Walker Kessler came in for Vanderbilt. Um, and I think that's um, and so and you kind of Rudy Gay came in for Kelly Olynyk, and then the uh, the last piece of the puzzle was uh, Nikhil Alexander Walker came in for Lowry Markkinen. So when you kind of think about the Jazz, I think you have to think about them in that fashion, is that the, um, that's, the, that's the mechanism or, or the way in which they are um, they're doing things. Okay? So that's just so the rotation is then Conley to Sexton, Beasley to Clarkson, Lowry to Nikhil Alexander-Walker, Alinek to Gay, Vanderbilt to Kessler is the way it works. So why did the Jazz start what they started, I think would probably be your first question. And and I think the answer is actually pretty simple. Um, and, and that is, the, the, first, the first one I would say is the length really matters. The second thing is that I don't think you lose a lot with that length in the process. I think you... Um, Markkinen is such a good shooter. A Linux, a ball movement guy. Vanderbilt's an energy guy. You, you're not losing, you know, the problem with length would be if you're losing gravity, you're losing stretch the floor, you're losing ball handling. I, I'm not sure you're doing that. Markkinen's really, really skilled. A Linux, your best passer on the roster. Vanderbilt is actually a pretty good ball mover and had good assist numbers there. So the lineup makes a lot of sense, and then you have length. Beasley's your best shooter. So... And then Conley really controls the team so well. So it, it it actually, you know, you see it and you think about it, it makes some sense. If you go back to the show we did, I think it was Friday, where we ran B-Ball Index's numbers on the various lineups that might be available, what we actually saw was that that one offensively had as much gravity, had as much ability, and the weaknesses that the roster has is the roster does not have a lot of guys that can attack the rim and get to the rim. And that's going to be a real, and so you're really going to have to spread the floor on this te for this team and really going to have to create space for guys to get downhill into the paint to create opportunities because we don't have guys like Pascal Siakam who can just put the ball on the floor and go to the rim one-on-one -on -one the way the Raptors do. I mean, that's what the Raptors are trying to do. So the, while the lineup might have been a little different than people anticipated, I think it also, um, you know, it is... It makes a lot of sense, and I like it. I like it. It was it was noticeably bleak. Markkinen has been really is really really good, and he's really really big, like stunning in person. How big a guy he is, and Alinek I think is the key to kind of everything this team is doing in regards to ball movement and those things. So therefore, uh, I think he's he's really vital. And then you know, I, the question I guess is you know do you want to start two six one guards? And Beasley is a forty percent three point shooter. And that's what allows you to kind of do this is then have that kind of space. So I, I think it's awfully good. The other questions, um, you know, some people were surprised. Uh, Andy Larson, I thought, used an interesting word in his article where he said curious. Like, you know, we haven't been to camp, so I, I don't I don't know how it's curious. But Nikhil Alexander in over for Abaji. I mean, let's just be perfectly clear on what that means. That means Nikhil Alexander Walker's been better in camp than Abaji's been. Right. Right. Like, I mean, like you can't run a team and you can't coach a group if players performances don't matter right like if you go to camp and one guy's better than another guy in camp then they should get an opportunity to play and then if they don't play well then the other guy gets the opportunity and if they play better they get to play like it's I mean it's really basic and simple but I, I mean I, I I don't know I mean the Nikhil Alexander-Walker got shouted out a bunch of times in all reports from Mike Conley and Will Hardy in press conferences. So he's playing super well. And he got the opportunity to play. But you can't 
really go into a season and just decide, hey, this guy plays no matter what. Uh, you know, Walker Kessler played in front of Cody Zeller. I'm going to guess he's had a really good camp. He looked really good in the game. Uh, and then in Rudy Gay's case, you know, you've got to try to figure out whether you can use Rudy Gay. Like, you've got to try to figure it out. He didn't look particularly great last night. Uh, that, that shot's still flat. Um, but hopefully he'll get his legs underneath him. And you're going to get a 17-year veteran to get his legs underneath him in games a little bit more in camp. So there's nothing actually that jumped out to me as surprising in that rotation. The one thing I looked at when, when I saw it coming was you got Sexton Clarkston and Nikhil Alexander-Walker on the floor at the same time. Those are three guys that are pretty heavily one-on-one -on -one players that don't move the ball a great deal. And I think that's going to be a really interesting one to keep an eye on. Can they do it? Do they play with enough pace that's all right? Do they play with enough defensive tenacity that's all right um, to do that? There's really – Sexton's a, trying to be a point guard, but and Alexander Walker's done some ball handling, and JC has too, but none of them are natural point guards. None of them – all their instincts are to play one-on-one. -on -one. So that's a – that's an interesting group. Now, if we're honest about the way this roster is constructed, there are going to be groups that are on the floor that have like that kind of blatant issue. If it's not, if it's not that group, it's Sexton and Conley, and you got two guards that are six one on your backcourt, and you're dealing with that. So that's not great. Um, if you're flipping it around in some other way, you've got um, you've probably got another matchup somewhere along the way. So I, I think you kind of have that no matter what. The, the, the last thing I would mention. On, on the game yesterday before we dig into kind of those who are stalwarts and those who struggled a little bit, is Toronto's really different. Toronto does not run pick and roll. They run a lot of handoffs. They run the second most isolation of any team in the NBA last year. Only Giannis and Milwaukee ran more. They ran the fourth fewest pick and rolls in the NBA. They play without a center. They play with five interchangeable parts. Almost all of them are 6'8", 220 other than Van Vliet. And, and they come at you. And so it's not an easy game to get, a if I'm Will Hardy, to get a read on my roster on. Because of the fact that they play, they play with such a different style and tenacity, and the fact that the Jazz matched it for 24 minutes is pretty good, um, and I think a, a great sign that they kind of saw how they can play and what they need to do. And then, um, but th but there is an element here where this is a different team. You're just you're you're playing handoffs instead of pick and rolls. You're playing. Um, isolation, You're, you've worked on switching and defensive concepts, and then Pascal Siakam just gets the ball and bogarts you the rack, and OG Ananobi does too, and Nick Nurse has put a huge emphasis on on getting to the rim. I listened to uh, Sean Woodley and Lockdown Raptors give me a whole breakdown on that. So I think there is something to this game where uh, it's a first game. It was great. It was in front of a sold-out house. It had a great atmosphere, but also that Toronto is different in the way other teams play, and so in that sense, it's probably not entirely the greatest uh, model by which for the uh, for us to kind of really take a lot of things and, and figure out along the way. Today's show, uh, Locked on Jazz, is brought to you by our friends over at Murdoch Chevy, located in Woods Cross. Also in Logan, the Chevy lineup, the Silverado, as well as the Colorado is the truck lineup, and it's just so good. I mean, just so absolutely fantastic. Everything about it uh, is, is that good. Uh, with the whether it's the Silverado truck, which is uh, I, I like to refer to it as the Lazy Boy truck of the year, um, that it, it gives you just kind of this great feeling of being up above all things, or whether it's the Zippy Colorado that's uh, doing everything you need uh, around and, and more versatile to you uh, and, and more affordable. Uh, the also the SUV lineup absolutely outstanding, as well as um, as you. Get the Equinox or the Blazer or the Trailblazer all uh, there for you as well um, with the incredible lineup of cars over at Murdoch Chevy. Plus, you got the Murdochs who give you over 80 years of time in Utah, part of the community. There's nobody you can trust more. That's why they have the no regrets approach to Murdoch at Murdoch Chevy. Go stop by. If you want to stop by, feel free to hit me up first. Today's show is also brought to you by LinkedIn. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MBA. Get the applicants you need for free. It's faster. LinkedIn jobs is faster, quicker, better systems behind all of it to be able to get you exactly the employee you want and you need. It's a tough job market right now to hire people and get the right person. And anytime you're hiring, it's time is of the essence. And that's why LinkedIn is your answer. LinkedIn slash locked on NBA. Post your job for free today at LinkedIn.com slash locked on NBA. 
Thanks so very much for making Locked On your first Locked On Jazz your first listen of the day. And amazing NFL content for you if you're an NFL fan at Locked On NFL. Also, the Game to Game podcast, one of my favorites, will launch the same thing in the NBA. That's on Locked On NFL right now. Uh, so go make sure you grab that uh, today. All right, who stood out? Well, the obvious is Lowry Markinen, and it's right. The box score is right in this case. He's just got amazing size. He's got multiple things he can do. He looked comfortable with the basketball. He was versatile with the different passing moving. He was defensively. He was active. I didn't, there weren't a lot of times where I saw him get taken advantage of. He really has worked out on that. He's one of the best athletes on the team at seven feet. I'm really impressive in that. Boy, can he ever run in transition. Uh, and then his ability on the break to finish. I haven't looked at his finishing numbers. I didn't expect that. But there was a play where he came right side, brought it up, down and around. Um, just to have that dexterity and uh, mobility and balance at that size. Uh, and then obviously he can really, really shoot it. But I, I was, you know, if he's open, he's going to get shots. He's going to knock him down. He's a, he's a bona fide shooter. But I was as impressed with his ability to play with the ball in his hands, drive the lane comfortably driving the lane at seven feet tall, uh, make some plays. You know, the reputation on him out of Arizona was soft. You sometimes wonder, is that just because he's Finnish? Is that because he actually was soft? Is that just because he had terrible coaching in his career? Um, I mean, he really has had, like, not very good coaching in his career. Now, maybe those coaches are, are better skilled coaches than they are wins and loss coaches. That's not something that I can know. But I think his run is Fred Hoiberg to Jim Boylan. Um, Billy Donovan's good to to J.B. Bickerstaff last year. like that, that was not a great foundation to start his career with Fred Hoiberg and, and Jim, uh, Jim Boylan in regards to having NBA success as a head coach. And, you know, again, I don't know about where they were skill development-wise. That's not a fair comment for me. To I wasn't in those huddles at those practices, but those teams did not perform very well, and those are not thought of as guys that were particularly innovative NBA coaches. Um in fact, in one of their cases, probably the exact opposite. So I think that, you know, you're seeing him really develop and mature into a player. And it, it was so interesting talking to Lowry about how, you know, the move to the U.S. was a pretty dramatic one for him. He's really tight with his family. He's the youngest of three kids. Both mom and dad played. They had this really group, tight group. And for him to go to Arizona was this kind of mammoth jump for him in his life that, that that was the hardest thing he's ever had to overcome was to make that jump at 19 then he plays so well in Arizona that next thing you know he's in the NBA and he's in Chicago and then he's got a new coach by his second year I just got a feeling he's just never gotten his footing um, and maybe this offseason in Finland when he was so great with Euro basketball was the beginning of him getting his footing and now we're going to really see him thrive but he was terrific and just looked so comfortable and he's so big he's just Seven feet, 235, just just a remarkable modern body. I, I thought Mike Conley uh, showed a lot of strengths last night. He had the team under control. Um, he was a calming effect. They got into what they needed to. He can get the ball where he needs to. He was comfortable. He got us started at the right point, at the right angles offensively, at least from my sight. Like maybe a coach is going to hear this and think I'm, I'm wrong on that but to me watching it kind of we were at a courtside angle like our offense flowed because it started at the right spots um, and frankly as much as anything how much that didn't happen when Colin was on the floor is maybe as much a comment as I'm having where I'm giving Mike credit on an area where it jumped out to me when Van Vliet got into Sexton we couldn't get the offense started from the right spots um, you know I'll also have Mike on the other side where he struggled I think there's you know as this there are some elements where Mike uh, and I'll talk about it in a second, where I think Mike is just better on a really, really good team. And so some of those things are going to hurt him. Uh, I thought Vando was interesting. His energy level is terrific. He ends up on the floor an awful lot. That, that um, you know, talk about something you don't notice when he plays for the other team, but you notice for us is he's diving in for offensive rebounds and ends up on the ground all the time, which leads to a five on four the other way. And, you know, the, the quick thought I had is Minnesota, I think last year had one of the worst transition defenses in the NBA, and it made me, you know, I, I, I finished the game last night and I did go check that like, huh, because I always have credited that that it was frankly, it was Carl Anthony Towns who just doesn't run back defensively like Minnesota's generally been over the last few years allergic to running back defensively. They played on a court that was downhill offensively and uphill the other way. Um, but I will say that that made me wonder a little bit. That's when you're when you're crashing the offensive board and don't stay on your feet that 
that's a problematic situation. That's a five on four um, all the time and is difficult um, to for teams to be able to, to deal with it. Um, in fairness, Minnesota improved last year um, defensively in regards to uh, their their numbers, and Vanderbilt played more last year, so it's probably not. It might be my original theory. Um, but they have always been a team that allowed a lot of transition. Last year they went from, I think, 20 – the year before they were like 27th. This year they were 21st in the league in transition, allowing a lot of transition. They actually got better at defending the transition um, as well, just to make sure that that's clear. So we'll see. I thought that – but I thought there were a lot of things on Vanderbilt to be really I, – I thought he, he conducted himself – uh, really well with the ball in his hands. I thought he got off the ball nicely. Um, I think he ended up with a four or five assists last night, uh, which is kind of exciting. Um, he's, you know, because you need him to be able to have the ball in his hands because he doesn't have shooting gravity. And so if he can dish it out, he had six assists. He led the team in assists last night. Um, he had three rebounds. He had a block. He had two points. His energy is just outstanding. Um, and so I thought Vanderbilt was was really, really good. Um, in a lot of those ways. Uh, and, and I thought Walker Kessler, again, is a guy who could probably go on both sides of this conversation. But there were some instinctual things from him that were good. One, how well he, he ran the floor. Um, he's got a physical skill that is surprising to me, and that is how quick a jumper he is. Um, we've seen him. We saw him grab a rebound and go right back up and dunk it. We saw a second jump last night that I thought was was different than what you would anticipate from a guy who's seven feet. Usually those guys have to go down and coil, and they go down and they have to, like, wait to get back up, and then they, they that's where they really are limited in what they're able to do. I didn't see that at all. His, he, he got a bunch of points on baseline cuts, which I'm assuming is a Will Hardy um, offensive play and a little bit of an instinct, but it's a great instinct. He cut at the right time you could tell he just was a natural basketball player at that point that cuts actually far more complicated than it seems like there's guys in this league who are super great at it pj tucker comes out of that corner really well when he was younger um in houston with james harden um that cuts and you have to time it right to be available and then what i thought was impressive is his catching and again how quickly um he got up to it he was the most prolific shot blocker in the history of college basketball and he found out he's not playing college players anyway precious atua Packed it on him on a play where I, we were really close, had a great angle on it. I think he thought he had him the whole way. Kessler thought he had Atchua the whole way, and Atchua just packed it on him. So he'll adjust on that, I think. Um, you know, remember, he's not going to be the greatest defensive player in the history of the game, which is pretty close to what we've been watching for the last eight years, and the greatest defensive player in the history of the game wasn't great to start either. So let's make sure um, that we give him, you know, the, the appropriate – um, time to to learn these things, but I thought he was he was really good. So my my like three stars of the game, if we were to do hockey, um, would probably have been Lowry, Conley, and Kessler. Uh, but I thought Vando deserved a shout out as well for a lot of the things he was doing um, last night in in the ball game. Uh, we'll talk about the guys that I thought had a little bit of a struggle, and I think it's going to be a season long kind of storyline for us as well in that regard uh, as we continue on today's edition of Locked on Jazz. It's your team every day. Our today's show is brought to you by our friends over at uh, betonline.net. Always a uh, pleasure to deal with them with your odds, news, scores, and all the latest over at BetOnline. Uh, to get your latest sports news and betting information, that is the spot for you to go and get what you need at betonline.net. Whether you're going to play Monday night football tonight, whether you need uh, more information about uh, the continued source for sports wagering with live betting and up-to-the-minute scores for every sport out there, the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite games and events, including MLB playoffs, MMA, boxing, golf go to betonline.net or use your mobile device to learn more it is bet online where the game begins what is the line on tonight's monday night game he wonders and i'm uh 49ers a two-point favorite again over the rams wow surprised by that broncos are a three-point favorite despite russell wilson's struggles on thursday night and I, um, the NBA futures is so fascinating to me. The team lines on the championship just keep changing. Warriors at plus 575, Boston plus 600, Milwaukee plus 700, 
Nets plus 750, Clippers plus 750, and Phoenix, who lost to the 76ers of Adelaide last night, um, plus 1,200. That's all at betonline.net. All right, so there were some guys that I thought kind of scuffled a little bit last night, um, and they were probably worth mentioning as well. And I think that they actually kind of all run into a similar theme on this. And so let me start with Malik Beasley. Malik Beasley's being asked. He, Malik Beasley over the last few years has shot like 50% of his shots as threes. And he's great at it. He's 39% career three-point shooter. He's one of the best like pure three-point shooters in the league. And so Malik Beasley last night's trying to do all sorts of different things. And that's, I think, something we're going to be seeing throughout the year on our guys. Is that as they try to stretch their games and get better we're going to see a little bit of this kind of these some of these shooting nights where they're not quite right. So Beasley last night takes three floaters, really four floaters, four kind of short mid-range shots, and he goes one for four. So that, you know, he had an unusually poor three-point shooting night, which just is a sign to me that, you know, he just wasn't quite ready and that not like not ready like mentally, just the ball's not coming to him as he's used to it. He's not used to who he's playing off, and he goes one for eight for three. Usually he's going to go three for eight on those threes like that's his general number so he just missed two shots he regularly makes and then he's four for 12 and then he go, you know if you suddenly don't go one for four on those and take some of those floaters that are stretching yourself out then suddenly he's like four for nine on the night like he's or he's you know five he makes another one of those he's five for let's say he's five for 12 which is a 40 percent night it's not great but he suddenly hit three threes and two other field goals and all of a sudden he's got 14 points like it actually becomes an okay night so it, it, it's not that I thought that there's something about his game that was, like, looked off. or I just thought he was kind of expanding his game a little bit, excited to be able to do that here from what he did while he was playing with Carl Anthony Towns and D'Angelo Russell and Anthony Edwards. And he sees himself, he looks out on the floor, and he looks at the starting line, and he's like, Conley, Beasley, Markin, and Linick Vanderbilt. Like, I'm the scorer here. And then that ends up him getting himself in some trouble. And I think we'll see that uh, consistently um throughout kind of with some of these guys trying to make some plays and do some things. Colin Sexton's box score line was super good. 11 points, a rebound, two assists, two steals, four of nine shooting, three of four from three. And he led the break well. On the other end, I didn't, I didn't think, I didn't think he looked, I thought like the speed of the game coming off the meniscus tear and having not played a little while, only played 11 games last year. I thought that was, particularly on the offensive end, was an issue for him. Now, and this is an interesting one where I always try to not react to the box score, but then you look at the box score and you're like, wow, maybe I'm like forgetting all the things he did super well. But I thought Van Vliet got into him and he and he couldn't get the offense started on a place. I didn't think the offense was quite in the, in the same control. I thought his handle was loose. He turned it over once or twice early in the ball game where he lost the handle out. So maybe those are just kind of you, you can have to be a little careful both with negative plays and highlight plays that you don't form a guy, your opinion on a guy based on those when there's a whole body of work. But I, I thought he looked a little uncomfortable trying to run the group um, yesterday. Now, he only played 11 games last year, so let's give him, again, same thing. Um, you know, I thought um, Mike Conley uh, is terrific, and I, I thought he really played well and controlled the team. Well, I also say, would say if we're going to be – he reminded me – um, that he's just not the player who is going to be able to dominate a um, a game and go score, you know, twenty some odd points a game anymore. That was that was kind of the other thing that jumped out at me. He he gets into the lane, and it's a hard question for him of how he's finishing once he gets into the lane. It's still a little bit of a hard question for him of how where how's he getting the ball back out to guys in the lane. He's um, you know, I think he'll be incredibly valuable to this team in the calming factors I put in the strengths. I also think there is a level where maybe Mike Conley, at this point in his career, is really super if he's on a great team um, and the way he was on a really good team in the past. Um, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, who by all accounts has had a really, really good camp uh, up to this point, uh, did some things well, five rebounds, three block shots, but obviously 0 for 4 shooting and four turnovers is not ideal. He just didn't look like he had a lot of space on the floor the way he probably wanted to to maneuver. Um, Jared Butler came in in that kind of tough eight-minute run 
where you're playing point guard for the final eight minutes, but these eight minutes are important. He went one of six with three turnovers. Um, couldn't finish around the rim. Did hit a nice off-the-bounce three. Cody Zeller set a beautiful pick. Actually, I put Cody Zeller, by the way, into the high marks. He made a beautiful handoff to Foncecchio, uh, where he read it so perfectly. They were trailing it, and if he hands it off early, then the Zeller's guy pops out on him, but instead he holds it, so Zeller's guy holds to him. Foncecchio's guy's trailing, and then he bounces the pass to Foncecchio, gets fouled on the way to the basket. I thought that was a beautiful play. His pick to clear um, Butler was a beautiful play that gave Jared Butler the open three, and Jared knocked it down. Uh, Butler got caught in the air with a few passes and, and some things turnover-wise that wasn't great. That last group really just, you know, the game was out of control and didn't didn't get a lot of things going there. And then I thought, you know, the deep for the if we're towing strengths and weaknesses or positives and negatives, like I thought the defense early in the game was super active and really into guys, and then I thought late wasn't. Like there was just a lot of room for guys' shots. We were not in guys and imposing on guys uh, in the second half of that game in the same way they were early. So it's great in the sense that, the Jazz are able to have the contrast of the two. All right, Portland tomorrow. We'll talk a little bit about it. They're, they're practicing today, and then uh, we'll have shoot-around tomorrow and get ready for Portland, which is kind of a more tradi – well, I think under Chauncey Billups, a more traditional team of where the NBA is. That Toronto team is just so different. I think that's a really hard game to make a lot of assessments out of. That is Locked on Jazz today. Thanks so much for making us your first listen of the day. For your second listen, how about Locked on NFL for a recap of the week or Locked on NBA for a recap of the weekend of the NBA preseason? That's all on the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.